Hip is the Associate Professor of Community Health and Sustainability, Department of Parks and Recreation and Tourism Management, and Fellow Center for Geospatial Analytics at NC State University, North Carolina State University. He's also in the, um, he's a built environment and physical activity researcher. Dr. Hip is PI of an NCI R21 project using public outdoor online webcams across the globe and the crowdsourcing website MTurk to measure physical activity in built environments. Dr. Hip is currently PI of a primary project within the Washington University in St. Louis, his former institution, that's part of the uh, Trek Center, which is the tr NCI Transdisciplinary Research on Energetics and Cancer. This project has a goal of understanding the effects of the worksite and the home built environment on human energetics and sedentary time, including using ecological momentary assessments. Dr. Hip is also employing EMA on a pre post investigation of employee and staff movement and collaborative efforts associated with new academic building on uh, the, the Washington University campus. Finally, he is part of the international team of researchers recently funded to develop Park Index, a mobile tool to facilitate active use of nearby parks. So his title today is, is Cameras and Crowds in Public Health Research. So please welcome Dr. Hip. streets. 
in the next 10 years. So this is brought over from Sweden. It's catching on in all the major cities in the U.S., but it, as well as in rural areas as well. So these are kind of the three contexts in which, which I'm thinking and which, which I'm trying to apply the work that you're going to see. So these are the environments that I'm interested in. Five of these are D.C., and one of these is Apex, North Carolina, the number one small town in America, according to Forbes magazine last year. Right? You can probably tell which one is, was, is Apex. And so these are the environments I'm interested in, and these are the types of aspects of the environments that I'm interested in. This is a, a barn stance, or how you can cross the street diagonally instead of having to wait on two signals to, to go diagonal. Um, there's, a, there's a cycle track. Um, here in the middle of this one, a, a bike lane in the middle, or a cycle track, and this is, a, I believe, a new light rail or, or trolley line being uh, installed. So with all true interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary science, it began um, not watching Top Gun, but began on the volleyball court, same volleyball court. So, so I said yes in the summer of 2012 to playing pickup volleyball with another faculty at WashU. And one of the other faculty members was Dr. Pless. And because he's not here today, he's goose, and I get to be mad for the rest of the conversation. Um, and so I, I played volleyball with him, and, and afterwards we, you know, we went out and had a beer, and we were talking about each other's work, and, and he told me, you know, as a computer scientist, I, I didn't know what I really had in common with him. Uh, but he started talking about how he's really interested in, in cameras and captured images and what data you can pull from captured images. And he's got a whole line of really interesting work. Um, but one of the pieces that he's been working on since 2006, so it's fantastic that Bernard um, and, and Bill talked about the difference in 2006 and 2016, because this data said again in the summer of 2006. Um, Robert, that summer, he got tenure, and he's like, now I can do a project that doesn't have to come to, to fruition, right? I, I can do something that might not work. So what I'm going to do is pay a few students to find every online outdoor webcam that's available. So just find the URL, find the camera, uh, and then let's start archiving images from those outdoor environments. And so these are two of the cameras. This is the camera on the barn stands and the camera uh, in Apex. And these are the, the photos that they're capturing, or the scenes that they're capturing. But by capturing an image every 30 minutes and archiving it, we're able to look at great longitudinal data and really look at depth. So instead of just a still image, um, oh, we have a lot of still images, but we're able to piece together how people use the environment in different ways at different times in different places. And the really fantastic thing, not only did this begin in 2006 and had started archiving in 2006, is that there's 30,000 cameras around the world, and we just passed the 900 million mark in terms of images captured. So 900 million images are now captured and archived, um, and then a data set that's, that's public. It's not super user friendly, uh, but it is public. And it's really all over the world. It's dominant in the US and, and Western Europe, but it's, it's truly a, a global data set. But not all the images are going to be related to, to human health or, or to walkability, right? There's, there's all sorts of wildlife cams. Um, there's a lot of treetop cameras. Every freeway overpass pretty much in the U.S. has a camera on it. This is what you see on the news in the morning for traffic reports. And, and some of that may be interesting to some of you. As a physical activity researcher, I'm not as much concerned about the person in the car. I want them to get out of the car, but I haven't quite figured out exactly how to use that car data. But the data that he has and that we have access to with these 900 million photos are, are housed in, in 30,000 individual websites like this. So this is, um, and I've got the website at the end. Um, so each camera, every image has been archived, and it, it's relatively searchable. So this is uh, a photo in Scandinavia, um, and you have here, the, the camera was added in 2010, right? And so you could, um, hopefully not during, during my talk, but maybe somebody else's talk, you can go online and add your own camera and start playing around with the data. Right, and so this was started being captured in 2010, and, and unfortunately it hasn't been captured in about the last month, but, but it was captured about a month ago. And these are every single image for one year that you see <coughs> across this red band. And so right here you have t day of year, so this is January 1st, and this is December 31st, and then you have time of day, so this is just after midnight on New Year's Day, and this would be just before midnight on New Year's Eve. 
And the red spots are where the URL was down, one of the limitations <laughs> to a public data set. They're all geo, uh, most of them are geolocated, and we also have used uh, several built environment audits to, to audit these environments. So this is the very first image captured by this camera, um, February 16th, 2010. Uh, in May of the same year, this was the first image I could find in which you could actually see the street infrastructure. Um, and the snow is gone, so I'm happy to be in the triangle and not be, uh, not be in Scandinavia today. Um, but you can see that there's a crosswalk here. Um, it's a two-way street. There happens to be a cyclist at the top. Um, there's a bit of a sidewalk on both sides. And then in July of, of 2013, um, the city decided to, to uh, have a built environment change to improve the walkability of this environment. And apparently in Scandinavia, you celebrate such things with a party five days later. Um, and so I, I don't know why they didn't do this before, but that's fine. So, so they had a nice party to so, celebrate their built environment change. And then just three months later in October, you can see some of the changes that have been made. So there's now a separated uh, pedestrian and bicycle path off of the road. There's a little curb bulb here, so it's pushing the street out, and they now have on-street parking. So that's narrowing the lanes and making traffic drive slower. Um, slower traffic equals less fatalities and serious injuries if there is, a, if there is an incident. Um, and they, they improve the sidewalk on the other side as well. You know, and, and with a lot of these cameras, we're able to capture the exact moment when the built environment changed. But again, in Scandinavia, I'm not really sure what's going on because you can see this is 1615 um, and this is 1645 the same day. So in 30 minutes, magically, a, a crosswalk appeared. I'm not sure of, of that efficiency. But it's, usually we catch the guys out there painting, but, but not this time. Um, and then this is the last image, uh, or one of the last images available um, from last September. And so, so what we have in this data set across um, five years here are the, pretty much, I mean, it's the same camera. The image you can tell is just slightly turned a little. But you've got an environment that has had a change that's going to impact how people are living actively there. Um, and we, we can think about that in 2016 and have access to this retrospective uh, longitudinal data. We can ask some of the questions uh, that Dr. Riley was interested in. Um, and, and this is really what got me interested. So you can imagine, like, of course I'm excited about playing volleyball this summer, it's the best time to be in academia. Um, but then I hear that there's this data set, and I was like, ah, this is, this is the data set that we need to answer a lot of questions. Um, so I was really excited about it. So really what the R21 is looking at in, in our current grant is, is what, what's working, what the environment is working, um, how can we use these cameras. It's, it's an R21, so it's a developmental grant. It, it's really looking at some of the methods. Um, we're looking at different environments, such as crosswalks, policies, reducing speed limits, say across the school, complete streets, um, all environments to get people out and moving more, or all policies to get people out and moving more. We've also been looking at programs, um, and I, I'm happy to talk to folks about this later, we're looking at programs in plazas and squares across the world, and how having programs, farm markets in those squares may increase people using those squares outside of just that market market time. Um, we're doing all this with public data. These, again, are, are websites that any of you can, can go to the URL. You can look at the image. The only difference is Robert has been right-clicking, saving as an image about every 30 minutes um, since 2006 for a lot of these. So our first time proof of concept study, and a lot of our work has been done in DC. Um, mostly because I knew there was a lot going on in DC um, related to walkability and activity. So this is a, an intersection in D.C., the image captured in 2009 and 2010. So you can see in 2010, they've changed this middle lane to a cycle track uh, or, or a uh, bike lane. And they've also added this uh, curb bulb here so that traffic can't go straight through there. So that protects the pedestrian a few extra feet. You actually see this a little better in Google Earth. And you know, Google Earth, you can in a reverse line as well, and take a look at what the environment used to look like. And so this is the same intersection. The star represents where the camera is located. And you can see that we now have this cycle track down the middle. Uh, the crosswalks have better visibility, and there's the curb bolt. So we wanted to take images and count people in them, right? So pretty simple science. Let's just look at photos and count people. So we did this, and we found that the likelihood of a bicyclist showing up increased um, almost 350% after you added the cycle track, right? You build it, they came, they're using 
the, the bike lane. Um, improving some of the, the crosswalks and the curb wall actually had no significant relationship with how many pedestrians were captured in these images. There was a slight decrease, though non, non significant. And then we did this for a few other environments in, in D.C. Uh, that added crosswalks only, and we consistently saw this increase in biking in D.C. Um, so what you should know, this is around the time that bike share began um, in, in Washington, D.C., and there were multiple efforts around biking, um, not just around pedestrian activity. Um, we, tried to be good, uh, we tried to be good public health researchers and have a few control sites. Um, you know, luckily for us, uh, there was no significant change in the majority of the control sites. Um, there was an increase in vehicular traffic um, in one of them. And so we had research assistants paying them you know, a rate of $12 an hour, sitting at a computer and counting how many pedestrians, how many bicyclists, and how many vehicles were in each scene. So we did this 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So that's about 24 photos. You can take one every half hour, five business days, uh, we had five intersections, we did five days before the built environment change occurred, and five days after, it was all time match. Um, and so this is 1,200 images, we had two RAs for reliability, um, and that, that worked fine, but it was relatively tedious and expensive. Um, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that new in terms of the information that we were getting. Um, it was nice that we could think about it retrospectively, but it really wasn't that new in terms of the information we were getting. In fact, a different project I was working on personally and professionally at the same time was, was counting the number of bicyclists and pedestrians in St. Louis. So I was, my wife and I represent four of these 174 volunteer hours at one of the 66 intersections. And, and so the national bike count occurs every September and cities across the U.S. have volunteers go out to intersections and, and count for two hours on two different days how many cyclists and pedestrians there are, are they wearing helmets, which direction, are they using sidewalks, etc. Right, and so this is, that's a lot to organize and a lot of volunteers to ask for their time. Um, and it's not that different than paying a student to look at a bunch of photos. Um, and when you have 30,000 cameras and 900 million images, you realize quickly that, that we're not ever going to be able to get through all this data. Matter of fact, I know at some point we calculated, you know, just curious, and I don't remember like what year, 2200, it actually it would occur that we'd be able to finally have the data on all of these. Um, but we knew crowdsourcing was available and citizen science was available and that this would be much quicker and much cheaper. Um, and really crowdsourcing for us right now is a means to an end. It's not the end, it's a means to get to the machine learning. Because ideally what we will have with this project is a camera and an algorithm so that you could go to a Department of Public Health, you can go to a Department of Transportation, you can go to a Parks and Recreation Department and say here's the camera you need, here's the algorithm, you can set it up, and if you want to know how people are using this new greenway um, before it's built and after it's built, just plug and play. And you can do this for things like tactical urbanism, where if you just want to paint a green lane temporarily and see how that changes behavior, you'll, you'll have this data. So that's, that's our end goal. We're, we are not there yet. Um, so, but we're using citizen science and crowdsource to get there. So we're using Amazon Mechanical Turk, MTurk. Um, it's, um, this is IRB approved through Washington University and, and now NC State. And, have uh, instructions for, for the users. And this is what the data looks like on, on the other end. So we asked them, when we first started, they just put a point on the person. We realized pretty quickly that wasn't super helpful. So now they draw boxes around uh, the cars, the pedestrians, and the bicycles. Um, and we had them draw the box for a few reasons. Um, one is, in terms of the machine learning, you can actually count the number of pixels that are there. Um, we still get the count that there's five pedestrians in this image, um, but we can also begin to use GIS in a very different scale to look at heat maps and where, where people are or are not. And maybe they're changing where they are based on time of day or season of the year, or even precipitation. And so, some of you, or hopefully a lot of you, are thinking, yeah, it's kind of fun, but is this, any of this reliable, especially crowdsourced? So we found that, um, that it takes the, depending on the method, either a mutually exclusive um, sum of four crowdsource workers or the average of four crowdsource workers to get a reliability stat that's pretty, that's consistently above 0.6 but often above 0.8. And so that's what we usually end up doing, is asking four individual crowdsource workers to annotate each image. 
And then we always take, you know, a 10% subsample uh, with RA, so we're still paying employing students um, to, to go through and validate that, that the crowdsource is, is still working well. And it's been really successful um, thus far. And it's really cheap because we're paying the crowdsource two cents an image. Um, and so this is a, another study that we're, that we're writing right now where we took 25 different built environments across the globe it took 1,000 photos before and 1,000 photos after, hence the 50,000 photos up here. And we posted it to, to MTurk, um, and it was two cents an image. And you can see some of the information that MTurk provides you. It took about a minute to annotate each image. Uh, and that's an, effectively, that's an effective hourly, hourly rate of just under $2, right? So it's certainly not minimum wage, um, certainly not a living wage. Um, and that's a question that we're often asked about using crowdsource. Um, they're volunteers, there's no coercion, there's no forcing. It's posted to a site with 300,000 other tasks they can do. Uh, and we just ask that they, they choose ours. Uh, and they, they provide the data. And then for them, if you're not familiar with MTurk, their money goes straight into an Amazon, into their Amazon account. So then they can you know, get Amazon Prime and, and, and stream movies. <laughs> so hopefully they're doing something active, but who knows. Um, and it doesn't actually take a full month. I just happened to not get the screen capture until a month afterwards. The very first one we did, that study with 1,200 images, um, we set it up, left the office at 5 p.m., came in at 8 a.m. the next morning, all our data was collected and done, um, which is fantastic to like sleep and have all your data collected for you. Um, so highly recommend it. Um, so these are some of the other environments that we're looking at. So it's not just street intersections. This is a plaza in Adelaide that's had a complete redesign. A uh, freeway in, or a highway in Utah that's added a bike lane. Uh, on the bottom is a soccer field outside Seattle. Um, in the middle is uh, another roundabout in Western Europe. Um, and then this top one's really interesting. This is, this is in Morocco. Um, so you can see the roundabout here, and I have no idea how this traffic pattern works, this kind of crisscross. Um, <laughs> It must not have, because they removed it, right? So, so this is all this parking and this crisscross is gone. It's now it looks like a pretty pleasant, walkable environment. And so, so we're using the images captured before and after to understand how many people are there, when they're there, and, and where they're located. So the images are captured right now every 30 minutes. And that's really just a, a, a matter of when you have 30,000 images, um, somewhat arbitrary to begin with in 2006. Um, but now it's, it's, it's a matter of terabytes of data. And so every 30 minutes coming across, there's about 20,000 active cameras, um, is a lot of data. So it's, it's every 30 minutes that an image is added. And it's offset, it's not exactly 30 minutes. So you're not always getting 1044 um, and 1114, right? It's 1044 and then 30 minutes and 17 seconds later. And then across the year, you'll get every single minute of the day. Um, but we, we wanted to know if there were better capture rates, especially if we were working with a specific, uh, a specific entity. So these are two, two intersections in St. Louis, Blueberry Hill, Blueberry Hill, um, and then this is a coffee cartel. So B for Blueberry Hill is the top, C is coffee cartel for a coffee uh, a place in Central West End in St. Louis. So here we sent students out for 20 hours over a week, and they counted pedestrians and bicyclists in real time and aggregated them in every 30 seconds, and we captured images at every 30 seconds. And then we just did correlations between a capture rate um, every two and a half minutes, a photo capture rate every two and a half minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 30 minutes. Um, and, and they were all significant. Uh, you can see the effect size probably isn't at, as high as we had hoped, um, but in terms of looking at trends over time, we're still really confident on, on the ability of, of this work. If you want to know how something's going to change during a specific hour over a short period of time, you're really going to have to capture video or images every 30 seconds. So uh, another kind of proof of concept that, that I wanted to, to share with you today um, looks at depth and breadth. So, so what Robert always wants to do is he says, I don't care about a single tree. I'm interested in the forest. So he wants to figure out how to do all what we're working on across all 30,000 cameras. And so for the machine learning, the, the technology is there for machine learning to tell you that a pedestrian, a bicycle, and a car excuse me, are in the scene for a single camera. But to do this across 30,000 camera, 30, cameras that you have no control over, you don't have control of the scale or the angle uh, of these, is really quite difficult. Because in, in one scene, a human may be only 5 pixels high, and in the next scene, a pedestrian may be 20 pixels high. And so he wants to be able to come up with a single algorithm that can work regardless of where the camera's placed. 
So he's, this is kind of the big picture that he's thinking. Um, so at the same time, while, while he's working on that, I took just two cameras. <laughs> and, and with the two cameras, I took every image for 17 months, um, between 4.30 a.m. and 9.30 p.m. And so this was about 20,000 images per camera. Uh, and so this, and, and you know, Bill mentioned in his talk with, um, with treatment A, is treatment A better than treatment B? And here our treatment were, were new crosswalks. And, and one of your questions was for whom, and unfortunately that's one of, uh, one of the limitations here that I'll get to is the for whom part is we're not able to get this with these images right now. But, but what context and what time when you're getting images from 4.30 to 9.30 across 17 consecutive months, you can begin to answer some of these questions. And it's not just a follow up a year later on where more people using this intersection. You can follow up when it's raining, you can follow up when it's hot, you can follow up when it's snowing. Um, so we, we had these two intersections, one was residential and one was, was more commercial. Um, and so the residential is at the top, this, these are pedestrians, average pedestrian per half hour. You can see it's a very small number um, on the scale there. And then the, the commercial downtown uh, DC, um, more numbers of pedestrians and you can see a very nice morning rush hour, lunchtime break and, and evening rush hour with the data. Unfortunately, none of it compares to how many vehicles are, are captured at all of these intersections, especially the residential intersection, which, again, you can see a very nice morning rush leaving the residential area and the evening rush from home. But we, we did look at, at the weather data, and, and so um, Peter James and I were talking about this last night because he, he's from D.C., and, and we were talking about how hot it was yesterday, uh, and we had planned on going for a run, but we were at this threshold of about 80, 86, so we decided not to go for a run uh, yesterday, and you can see that's what most people decide around 80, 86, that I'm not gonna be out walking in this environment. Um, we looked at differences across months, and, and there's, you know, there's a significant peak in the spring, and a significant peak in the fall, with a, a, significant, a significant decrease in the middle of the summer. And so what I can tell you is the addition of the crosswalk, when you look at that single metric, that single number, were more people out walking in either of these environments after you added a crosswalk, um, the answer is no if you just look at all 17 months. But if you start to look at other information, um, you see that there are significant differences. In, in that warmest month and, and that one of those coldest months, um, there were more people out during that um, worse weather, less ideal weather. We're still working on the precipitation data. We've seen with only one camera, but we haven't been able to replicate it yet, but that when it rains, you actually have more people out when you have better visibility in terms of crosswalks and bike lanes, which, which makes sense. But this is a nice addition that you don't capture um, if you just have a single pre and post. So we took out the average, this is the, the percent of photos with, with a pedestrian in them during ideal temperatures. So this is just the mean and within one standard deviation of the mean versus uh, times when we were outside of the single standard deviation. And you can see outside of that single standard deviation, um, after the crosswalk, there was a significant increase in the number of pedestrians. And we checked the weather was a significant difference across those two times. Uh, hopefully, ideally, optimistically, is I have a protected environment, I can get across the street quicker, um, I'm going to use it. That might be way too much optimism, but, but that's what I'm sticking with. And then in terms of breadth, we do have these 30,000 cameras, but we're really looking for areas like Manhattan uh, and Washington, D.C., where we have 120 or so intersections with cameras. So one of the other limitations with this work is if you put, if you had that single intersection in Apex and you improve the bikeability or walkability of that intersection, you might not be actually increasing active living or walking or biking in Apex. You're just getting people to use that one street instead of using multiple. And so what we're, one of the things we're working on with Columbia University and, and New York City Department of Transportation and Public Health is using a, a better grid so that we can tell if you place an infrastructure change at one intersection, are you really just diverting people to that? Um, or, or are you actually perhaps getting new users? This is also where our Vision Zero work is coming into. Because New York City is kind of leading the efforts of Vision Zero in the US, and so they have really nice, uh, consistent data uh, in terms of fatalities and serious injuries at intersections. Uh, they're also using crowdsourcing and citizen science to, um, 
to audit every intersection in the city, every street segment in terms of the built environment. So we have built environment data, uh, we have fatality and injury data, but what's missing is that denominator. How many people actually use these crosswalks? And if you have a change, does that denominator change? You know, what's the incidence rate? And so that's, that's our cell to them. So we can provide incident rates and we can provide that retrospectively, um, as well as prospectively. So who cares? Well, well, I hope you care. I hope you found this at least entertaining, or you know now that Arnold Schwarzenegger's autograph is in my office, um, and that I play volleyball once in a while if you ever need a sixth person. Um, but you know, this is this is public health surveillance. This is what the CDC is interested in in terms of walkability and walking. This is this is a, a new way of, of surveillance. A lot of the mobile data is there too. This is a different scale and a different opportunity. And so, in combination, I think we can really ask important questions. And so, when Bernard emailed me, that was the sell to me. I, I knew here. I've been here eight months. Uh, he promised lots of potential colleagues at Duke and Chapel Hill. And so I was like, sweet. I will I will come give my sales pitch for for a few minutes. Um, but bill environment changes are happening all the time, policy changes, programmatic changes. Uh, and we don't always, you know, these are all natural experiments. We don't always have the time or the ability or the knowledge beforehand that these are going to occur. And with a, a system of publicly available webcams, um, we're able to capture some of these. And ideally, prospectively, we would use this, use this technique as well. Um, and that, that gets to part of the appropriately targeting internet. So if you know that the Greenway system here in the triangle is going to expand, if you know that light is going to come in, you can start to use these methods because um, it removes a lot of bias uh, from, from some of the data. You can analyze these trends over time and you have fantastic baseline data. So I mentioned some of the disadvantages. It's, it's a ton of data. Um, we're still working on the processing and machine learning. The image capture rate of every 30 minutes is certainly not ideal for every study. And using public cameras is, is nice because um, they're already out there. I don't have to recruit anybody. I, I don't have to incentivize anybody for that. Um, but, but public cameras have what computer scientists call are jitter problems. And so that's where they move a lot. Um, I'm going to move this. I'm not playing the drums up here. Um, so public cameras have what are called jitter problems, and so that's where they bounce around. And so if you're teaching a mechanical Turk, uh, uh, if you're using this within um, machine learning and your pixels are moving up and down because of the wind, um, that's a problem. And so overcoming this jitter problem is, is something of interest. Uh, some of them also rotate. You can have a camera on a single intersection and it wants to know what's going on on all four areas of that intersection. Um, and so you have to be able to know which side of the intersection you're looking at. So these are, these are, and URLs change. DC's fantastic about taking the same camera with the same URL on one intersection, just deciding without telling me that they're going to move that camera to another intersection, right? And so all of a sudden your data just all of a sudden on a completely different street. Uh, so these are, these are some of the, the limitations that we face. And obviously diversity. A lot of these are urban areas. Uh, a lot of these are commercial areas. Um, we're not getting into, uh, there aren't a lot of cameras in low income communities and certainly communities of color. Uh, and so, you know, if we continue using public cameras, that's going to probably continue to be a limitation. Um, and then types of physical activity. This is something we are actively working on. We're using the compendium of physical activity. Uh, we're really interested in what can we capture other than just pedestrian and bicycle. Can we, can we capture other data? And can we capture things like um, it's, it's me and Donna walking, so it's a pair of people walking and getting some of that social aspect, not just individuals. And, and how may that be important to build environment aspects? Um, but there are a lot of advantages as well, right? We can retrospectively think of, uh, about this uh, and, and ask these questions. We eliminate a lot of bias. We can, in, in St. Louis, we were doing a Greenway study. We had a student hear gunshots. We had a student whose bikes were stolen, and that impacted how long they were out collecting data, right? Um, and so, so these are real world things. I'm sure you all have stories of real world data collection. Uh, and so though there are limitations to, to the cameras, um, it's going to stay there in the rain. It's going to stay there in the snow. It's going to stay there when it's 110 degrees. And this is eminently scalable. We've been looking at just a few cameras, um, and somewhat we've scaled at time, but we're, we're working on scaling this up to a, massive, uh, to a massive amount of data. So again, I was excited here to hopefully sell myself a little bit um, and, and meet a lot of you, um, but, but I feel like there's, there are a lot of good connections um, across the three universities here, or four universities, 
Um, but also, like, why, why should I be here and why should you care about kind of this scale? It's, it's some of the same questions um, in terms of methods and data collection that you're interested in, right? There's better data out there. This is fun. Like, I really enjoy the webcam work. But it, it wouldn't matter if we're not able to answer important questions, right? Like, you can only get so far on it being a cute tool. You, it really has to answer important questions. And, and that's something that we're all working on. Um, the scalability is important. The use of citizen science and crowdsourcing um, is also something that we all have in common. And then a lot of us are using captured images, whether through mobile devices um, or, or these um, environmental cameras. Uh, so with that, you know, so, so here's Robert's Twitter. He's got a hashtag, hashtag Amos Pick. Um, Amos is Archive of Many Outdoor Scenes. That's the website there. Um, so once in a while, he'll post really funny photos. So this looks like a fantastic car carousel uh, um, somewhere. Um, but, but, you know, feel free to follow either of us. Robert's, the website is, is somewhat usable. Um, and there's my contact information if you have uh, additional questions later. So we have time for a few questions. If you want to go up and use the mic. Sure. Yeah, that's that's great. That sounds really interesting study. Thank you. So, um, I mean, I, I guess I see a, a, a few potential ways. One is trying to figure out are there cameras in those zip codes, um, and then looking for capturing what environmental changes or overlaying spatially the policy changes in those areas and capturing data at least in terms of numbers. Um, but if there are specific areas, you can, you can capture at a much quicker rate. You can capture video in some of these. Uh, and so maybe an interesting study with walking speed is finding a, a, a gate expert and understanding can you capture the gate of somebody walking at, at different speeds in the image, um, and does that correspond with, with you know, if, if I capture somebody like this versus somebody like this, um, does that correspond with, with different speeds in that area? Um, I think. You know, it, it's this is data is fantastic for the environment, that specific environment. So if changes are occurring or if it's going to occur at different times, it's really good. Um, but without moving really towards video outside of image, looking at some of the, the speed analysis would probably be a little tricky. Um, but I'd be happy to, to figure out, because I know there's bandwidth available. Um, so we're just looking for the really the, the right way to use some of the bandwidth um, on, on a new study. So, thank you. So much. I'm Dory Steinberg, uh, faculty here at Duke Digital Health. Um, I have a question about crowdsourcing, something that came by, and the idea that you can go to sleep and wake up the next morning and all your data collection is done. Um, and I'm not that familiar with MTurk, but I'm curious to get any information about the people who are actually, you know, rating the photos and um, and or, or can, is that is that important? I don't know if that matters, but sort of thinking about for other potential things you want to use them to code for. Uh, can you get that information? You can. Yeah. So so for those. I'll just give a quick kind of primer on MTurt. So it's, it's run, run through Amazon. You have to be over 18 years of age and have a credit card that you can have the money um, put into on, on Amazon. Uh, beyond that, there's an, an, an internet connection. Beyond that, there, it's pretty wide open. I mean, there's, um, there's some studies, I'm happy to send them to you, of, of where people are, are working from um, and when they're working, some demographics. For all of our studies, we haven't asked any of that information. And a lot of that was for IRB reasons. You know, we were interested in annotation of these images, not in the, the human subject that we're providing the, the data for us. And so it made it a much simpler IRB for us because we weren't collecting where in the world they were, man, woman, age, anything like that. Um, 
but you can. You can certainly ask that. You can also restrict geographically. You can also, like, um, like many, uh, like many um, citizen science projects or, or, or apps, you can restrict based on their ratings because you can provide ratings and you can say, I only want somebody who has a certain number of stars or has participated in a certain number of projects. Um, and a lot, there's a lot of academic projects there now, but Amazon really started MTurk as a way to provide um, further information for all that they were selling there. So if they put up a photo and they needed t keywords for what that toy was or what that book was, um, they were paying the crowd to provide some of that information. Uh, Joe McLaren, I'm part of the psychiatry here too. Uh, great talk, just fascinating uh, work. Um, I have to imagine you don't see this often, but do you ever capture evidence of accidents and any insights, um, any insights there about factors that might contribute to um, We've We've seen a few emergency response vehicles. Um, you know, again, with, with every 30 minutes, that's, um, you know, especially with the Vision Zero work, because we've been work looking at a lot of images in New York City. And so we've found a few emergency response vehicles. We haven't yet tried to time match it with the data to see if it was actually one of the incidents. Um, but no, that's, that's certainly one of the limitations. And that's, you know, that's with reliability. The stats I showed you were for pedestrians, because it, they're more likely to be there than cyclists. And so the reliability, you know, if something ha occurs infrequently, the reliability goes down. It's harder to, to capture that. And if you miss it, obviously, it, it's, a, it's a bigger error as well. So that, that's, why we're trying, sorry, that's why we're triangulating, trying to triangulate a lot of the data, because we know there's some of those limitations. Yeah, a lot of the talk. I was wondering about um, the potential seeding this use of methodology for uh, when you're doing some population where you're trying to increase physical activity in parks and stuff like that, which I assume that's the direction that you're going in. What are some of the ethical issues with putting up cameras that aren't already installed when you're doing that for operation health? Are there things that you want to possibly add to local communities or work with um, stakeholders to, to ensure that your camera placements are... Yeah. So I haven't had to work on that a lot myself yet because we're using the public cameras. Um, but we've obviously had quite a few conversations around that. And we did have one project. It was on a university campus, right? So Wash U was getting a new, um, was getting a new residence hall. And they have cameras all over. And so we agreed with the university. They wanted to see how, um, in the design of the new building, they wanted to know how students were using the outdoor space around their residence halls. And so they gave us access, um, closed circuit access to their images. Um, but so what we did with that is we went to the residents and the undergraduate government and provided a presentation to them, let them know that we were going to have access to these images of the outdoor spaces and these were the purposes for doing that. Um, beyond that, I mean, usually you see in, in parks, that if, if there is a camera in a park, um, especially a park more so than an intersection, um, there's usually you know, a placard or a signage that says this area is under surveillance. Um, so there's a few differences. Obviously, we're archiving this, and so we're, we're keeping that image. So a lot of places would just keep it for 24 hours, 36 hours, but we're, we're archiving um, these images and, and have had some for, for 10 years. Um, and so moving forward, that would just have to be additional information that you provide if you wanted to continue to archive it. Um, but it, it's, definitely a, it's definitely an aspect that needs to um, probably go through a, a study of itself, what's the most applicable, useful information um, that won't change the habits there that people are safe with. Um, it, uh, to this point, it, it's been more like, you know, we're not trying to give you a red light ticket. We're really interested in physical activity and ways to improve the environment. But, you know, but you've got to have people trust you. You've got to have that buy-in up front. Thank you so much. Thanks.